In 2010, the floods in Pakistan left 20 million people thirsty. And the West let those people go thirsty because it refused to cooperate with the Taliban. The problem for opposition in this debate is that these forces are not transient, fleeting, or weak, but they are permanent features in these futures of these nations. And you need to engage with them to get any kind of long-term good outcome. That's what we're going to bring you in extension. The most important point in this debate, that we are the side that moderates these groups and makes them better. Before I do that though, I'm going to add more extension material about the, about the morality of these decisions. And finally, I'm going to talk to you about why these are the only groups who can distribute aid and the only groups you can't rely on the state who is also involved in this conflict to distribute aid. Firstly, on morality. We say that the West and all actors in the international arena need to make nasty geopolitical trade-offs all the time. That's why, for instance, we recognize and give aid to dictatorships that may abuse the rights of their citizens, but ultimately decide that, have, that ultimately we decide that those citizens having things like economic having things like economic rights, the ability to live, is worth it, right? So but we also know that we also know that these guys are also being complicit in deaths, right? Even if we accept even if we accept the assertion that we prevent the conflict, these guys are also complicit in debt by like, you know, not actually giving these people food and water and letting them starve and those types of things. So, what this debate essentially comes down to then is which trade-off should we prefer? Should we prefer the risk of death through conflict or should we prefer the risk what? of death by not giving them aid? The first thing to say is that we think that the activism distinction breaks down here when you have the capacity to act and you don't do so right. We say that it's very different to giving someone a gun when you are the one who can give them food and water and you refuse to do that type of thing. But secondly, we would say that the harms of not giving these people food and medicine are immediate and certain, whereas the harms of the conflict continuing into the future are speculative and uncertain to continue into the future. So we think the moral obligation falls on you to do the thing that you know is going to happen rather than speculate about the thing that is going to happen in the future. Thirdly, about the point of information I ask, is that we actually think that legality is a terrible metric for deciding who you owe a moral obligation to, right? Because, because legality is constructed and decided by arbitrary political forces, right? Uh, so the point of information I asked about the Khmer Rouge was really important. So Vietnam asked for the Khmer Rouge in, in, the Khmer Rouge in 1979 because the United States had like, you know, ongoing tensions with Vietnam. They continued to recognize that like, genocidal regime as the legitimate government in that nation. We don't think the humanitarian organization should buy into that type of political horseplay and those types of things because obviously their primary obligation is helping individuals on the ground, not respecting things like arbitrary international rules which we think are meant to serve powerful interests, not the interests of the most weak or the ones they care about because they're international groups. Opening opposition tells you that more guns equals more atrocity. The first thing to say is that's untrue. I'm going to tell you why in my next argument. But the second thing is on a utilitarian calculus, and opening government touched on this, but I'll add further, we think that guns kill far less people than things like disease, things like things like lack of food and water, right? So like cholera outbreaks when there are refugees on the border can have the potential to kill millions and millions of people. When we've literally never seen that, like, like, you know, like, like, it's very rare to see a genocide that actually goes that far in those types of things. But thirdly, right, we just oppose the notion that you, because you're involved in conflict, makes you an immoral actor in this debate. We stand by the right of, of we stand by the right of groups to oppose with violence oppressive regimes that the West just decides they want to recognize, right? We think these groups aren't all bad. We should support them in their fight and and, 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 and for doing these types of things. Second point in this debate, this is the most important. How do we actually moderate these groups, given they are likely to be a long-term feature of these states in the long term? Opening opposition makes a really damaging concession, that these groups need to be seen Question. to be doing good, which answers why they will actually accept this aid. Because, because we think if they reject this aid, then the image of them is that they aren't doing good, is that there is, 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 that, is that they could do, is that they, is, is that there is something that they could do to help their citizens, and they're actively turning their back away from it. So we think they're likely to accept that aid. But secondly, once they accept that aid, we think we get some way in terms of undermining their message. Because now, because now, yes, they, now yes, they are doing good, but the West also has a role to play in that type of thing. The West is also seen as a good actor, which we think ultimately moderates those groups. We also tell you in this debate that we, we also tell you in this debate that we mitigate the incentive for atrocities, right? Firstly, right, if you kill all the civilians, then you have no civilians to give the aid groups access to. Okay. So you can't keep getting the funding that aid groups are giving to you, right? So we don't think they're likely to murder civilians. But secondly, right, we say that we say that if we accept this is a hostage situation, one of the reasons 
why people murder hostages is they're actually really expensive and really hard to keep alive, right? So rather than keep on feeding them and using up your precious resources, they just murder them. So they'll accept the aid. So, 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 so we think they'll accept the aid and give it to these people, and that means we think, and, and, that, and that means we think we save lives. But moreover, we think that even in the case where we do oppose these points, we can oppose them in other ways. For instance, we can make short-term trade-offs like this in, 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 in the case of a long-term war. So we can make a short-term trade-off and agree to give the Taliban some funding in, 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 in a broader struggle by also fighting a broader war against them. I'll take the point of information for things that have Okay, under the status quo, you don't have an active incentive to harm civilians. Now, on your side of the house, you absolutely do, because there's funding coming from doing so. No, you have, you have an incentive to harm civilians because they cost money to keep alive. We give you money if you keep them alive and give us access to them. We win those incentives in this debate. The final thing I want to talk about in this speech is about distribution. Opening opposition lied when they said that these groups are weak. Firstly, they have the capacity to control vast numbers of vulnerable civilians as the topic states, right? But also, we think these individuals are often very popular. They're seen as the only legitimate way to oppose an oppressive state. We give you the example of the Taliban in certain areas of Pakistan, who are seen as legitimate in a religious sense, whereas the secular Pakistani state is not. We give you the example of Hezbollah in Lebanon, which, yes, was an illegal militia group, but now is the state because it's the only one that's legitimate. So, we think that given that these groups are powerful, why do we need to cooperate with them? One, because they control the land, and we don't think the state, who may also be involved in this conflict, can distribute aid to them, because they're not going to get the type of access, right? We think that humanitarian groups are important in that respect, because they're neutral, they're not actually involved in that conflict. Secondly, military capacity is the type of thing that military capacity or use for the state using guns is the type of thing that would escalate the conflict, right? Three, we just don't think that the individuals in the circumstance will necessarily accept aid from the state. We don't think they necessarily accept aid from the state because they're not necessarily seen as legitimate. They have a lot of buy into these so-called illegal groups, right? But fourthly, right, this debate has to take place where those states are failing because if the state is able to provide aid, then we wouldn't need humanitarian groups to actually intervene and go in and do types of things. This debate it occurs in a context in which humanitarian groups are the only ones who can do it, and we're telling you why these individuals aren't likely to trust the state. Mr. Speaker, we think these groups are part of the long-term features of these countries, that they have the capacity to control the lives of thousands, if not millions, of vulnerable individuals. We're the team that shows you how you moderate them in the long term and make them less likely to commit atrocities, and that's why we won this debate.